Well, we've been in a series now for a couple of weeks and the title of it is what's called Too Strong. Everybody say Too Strong. Too, too strong. You know, too strong is about a strength that's available to every Christian. Every Christian, there is a strength that is available to every one of us. And what we have found out is that it is the theme of Psalms 15. The theme of Psalms 15 is too strong. Look at what it says in verse one of Psalms 15. It says, Lord, who shall dwell temporarily in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell permanently on your holy hill? What I want you to notice is it talks about two dimensions of our relationship with God. The first, he said, was a tabernacle type experience. And the other is what he called the holy hill experience. Realize that in Psalms was in the Old Testament and we've tracked it all the way into the New Testament. But tabernacle in the Old Testament was representative. It's called the tabernacle or the tent of God was representative of the moving presence of God, the leading presence of God in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that God was with the Israelites, but he led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And what we have talked about and laid the foundation is that God wants us to be sensitive to his leading in our lives. He wants to lead our life every day when we're in the grocery store, when we're talking to a neighbor, when we're walking down the beach, when we're at work, whatever we're doing, that we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the small nudging of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But then the next thing is he said, Lord, who is the person who is, go who is going to dwell temporarily in your tabernacle? And who is the person, Lord, that is going to dwell permanently in your holy hill? And what we found out is that in the Old Testament, holy hill was representative of Mount Sinai. It was called Mount Horeb or the mountain of God. And it was the permanent, never changing presence of God. It is the stability and the unchangeable presence and promises of God in our everyday life where his word and his promises, what they do is they stabilize us in a crazy world that when things are going on and things are happening, what we do is what we're standing on is God's word that it doesn't change, that he is stable, that he is immovable and that he is over and in my life. But then and at the same time, we're sensitive to his leading. We're sensitive to his stirring. And what too strong is, is it's sensitive to the spirit, but anchored on his word in our life. You know, there is no strength that this world has to offer that can even come close to the strength of God. It cannot even, it is all, it is like Red Bull. How many of you know what I mean? Red Bull is good, but you got to keep hitting it to stay up. And then you got to take something to go down. How many of you know what I mean? And, and what it is, is that God's strength is, it is connected. His strength is connected to his ability and his ability. How many of you know, God can do anything. He can do anything. And it's a strength that gives us the ability to overcome and to see beyond anything that is happening happening in our life. And it comes out of our walk with him. It comes out of our relationship where we're building our lives on the truths of the Bible, that we're, we're anchored on the truths of the Bible in our everyday life. And, it, and what it is, is we just begin to get more stable in our life. Look at what Jesus said in John 7 verse 24 through verse 27. Man, I just feel like I got excited during worship and I feel like my voice, do I sound squeakier than normal? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me get a drink. <laughs> Look, you know you got a squeaky voice when you call somebody and they say, yes, ma'am. How many of you <clears throat> yes. <laughs> anyway, look at what it says in, in Matthew 7, verse 24. It says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise. Look at listen and follow. They're like a wise person who builds a house on a solid rock. Verse 25. 
Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. Verse 26, but anyone who hears my teachings and doesn't obey, it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. What I want you to notice is this, is God said, it's not magic. It's the building materials. If your life is stable and last, it is because of the building materials you're using. You're, I'm using God's word to build my life. It's underneath me. It is governing my decisions. There's a humility and a hunger and an openness to what God says to my life and my heart. But it's also, we're growing more and more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. We're building our lives on the teachings of the Bible, but we're also realizing that Jesus said in John 16, seven, he's told his disciples, he said, it's necessary that I go away because if I don't go away, then the Father will not send the Holy Spirit. And so what it is, is it is two dimensions in our life. In Romans 8, 14, it says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so go back with me, if you would, to Psalms 15 and remember the, the question that was asked, Lord, who is the person that's gonna live close to you? Send Sensitive to your Holy Spirit's leading and stable on your unchanging word. And so verse one, he identifies what too strong is, sensitive to his spirit, but stable on his word. But then in verse two through verse five, is God is sharing truths and answering that question of who that person is. They're cultivating these truths in their life. And so we've already covered verse two and we've identified four truths. And so I'm going to say, Say them very quickly, and we're going to be in number five today. But verse two says this, he who walks and lives uprightly. We found out number one was uprightly. Number two, it says, and blamelessly and works rightness and justice. That was number three and speaks and thinks the truth in their heart. That was number four. What we found out is upright is I have personal convictions in line with God's word and I live by them. That my beliefs and my personal convictions are in line with God's word and they affect how I live. The second word was blameless. How many of you know we all make mistakes? Let me just say this. If these are striking a, um, a, a spot in your heart, you can go online and the podcast is there. You can lit or you can just listen to it or you can buy a CD of the previous two weeks at guest services. But when you look at the word blameless, what we talked about and what we found out is that when we make a mistake, we handle it God's way, freeing ourselves and others in our life where we handle that mistake God's way. Number three is we look and it says works rightness and justice. In other in other words, I do what I know is right in spite of how I feel. How many of you know, sometimes that's the hardest thing to do when we know what's right, but we don't feel like it because they did this or they said that, or I'm just not feeling it. Well, works rightness and justice is when I, when I do what is right in spite of how I feel. And the last one, number four, is this, is it speaks and thinks, the person speaks and thinks the truth in their heart. The truths of the Bible must affect what I'm speaking to myself and what I'm thinking about myself on the inside. Realize this, before anything is ever on the outside, it is first on the inside. And so that what we've got to realize in our life is the outside is the ornaments on the tree but the inside when I am when I am speaking and thinking the truth of God in my heart and I believe
believe it. It doesn't matter what is going on on the outside. It is only a matter of time because it's coming against the truth of God's word. How many of you know what I mean? And so it's what, what I'm speaking and what I'm thinking and identifying with on the inside. I'm no longer identifying with a negative something in my past, but I'm identifying with a promise that God has given me in that area of my life. And so let's, let's look at verse three now, and we're gonna jump into um, number five. Look at Psalms 15, three. So we're talking about the too strong, who's too strong? Verse, um, verse three, it says, he who does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his friend, nor takes up reproach against his neighbor. Look at, that's the way the Amplified says it. This is the way that, that the New Living says, verse three. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna read King James for you that are 500 years or, or older so that you can, you have a, the only reason I'm reading King James is because when you track the Hebrew, you need to go back to the King James because we're gonna uh, define a few of these words. But look at what um, King James says. He or she that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doth evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his neighbor. What I want you to notice is the King James uses the word neighbor two times. And we look at that and we glaze over it. If you look at the New Living in the Amplified, it interacts between friend and neighbor, friend and neighbor. But when you look up these two words, neighbor, is they're very different Hebrew words. And they're, they're, it's very significant. The first word neighbor there means an associate more or less. And it is really broad in, its to, in the way that the word is used. It could be a brother, it could be somebody that is close, but then equally, it could be somebody that we don't even know or somebody that is just a casual acquaintance. And so that is the first word, neighbor. So, and the, the second word, neighbor, is totally different. And this word, neighbor, means somebody who is near. It is a place of kindred. It could be an ally, somebody that, cl that is close and approaches at hand. It is any kin, kinfolk, kinsmen. It is somebody that we would look at and, they were, and we would say they are very close and they're right next to me. It is somebody that means that we draw near to them in our heart. What I want you to notice is this, is he speaking to us in regard to how we talk about other people, whether we don't even know them, whether they're distant or whether they're close. God is saying the way that you talk about other other people affects the sensitivity of my spirit over your life. If you talk about people wrong, God said, you are not going to sense my presence over your life because I gave my life for every human being. Amen. Are you with me today? This is number five. Number five is God's grace on my life is affecting how I talk about others. It affects how I talk about others. You know, everybody, I like Joyce Meyer. How many of you like Joyce Meyer? I just love Joyce. I remember about 20 years ago, I was listening to Joyce and she was just kind of a personal moment. And she said something. She said, you know, um, a couple years ago, and Joyce just has an anointing and a grace on her life. And I just love Joyce. And she said, I got up to preach. And she said, it was just the most difficult, hardest thing. Nothing was flowing, nothing was coming. It was difficult and it was hard. And she said, I went back and I said, Lord, what is wrong? If it's like this, I don't wanna do this. And the Lord spoke to her and said, I heard what you said about that person. And she said, well, Lord, I didn't say it, they said it. And the Lord said, you agreed with them. And if you expect to sense my presence over your life, that better stop. See, what we have got to realize is this, is that the Holy Spirit in and over our lives is affected by how we talk about other people. Whether they're distant, whether we agree with them, some people, let me tell you, social media has taken this to a whole new level. 
We can just trash people that we don't even know. And I'm telling you, let me tell you something. Uh, baby Christians talk about people. Mature Christians pray for people. And I don't care how long the person's been saved. If the person's been saved 30, 40, 50 years and they talk about pe people, they're a baby Christian. They're a baby Christian. And as Christians, what God is saying here is he's saying, my grace on your life should affect how you talk about other people. It should affect the way that you talk about other people. And I want to be clear when I say this, let's just stop. And I realize this, that we've all screwed up here. How many of you know what I mean? Okay, look, we're at church. Jesus is watching. <laughs> How many of us have screwed up in this area? Put your hand up. Come on. You know, if you don't get your hand up, I'm going to throw something at you. Okay, we have all, every one of us have screwed up. We have all done this in the past, whether it is intentional or whether it is unintentional. But I believe that today the Lord is saying, that needs to change if you're going to have a sensitivity to my spirit in your life. That needs to change. Is Sometimes we're not even aware of it. Some of us sitting here were raised in homes that just talked about people, just trashed them, just talked about people. I want to tell you, you know, I got 15 brothers and sisters myself. How many of y'all know that is a boatload? That is, I got... That is a, I got 15 brothers and sisters and, and I go around to family reunion and there's always like three or four of them just talking about people, just talking about people. And I'm just like, I'm just like, and they try to rope me in and I'm just like, man, you guys just got dumpster mouths. So I told them, and they're like, you're offending me. I said, well, you're offending Jesus. <laughs> it's like, quit talking about people. You say, well, this is just the way my family is. Well, you know what? You can stop and you can say, I'm going to be close to them and sensitive to them, or I'm going to be close to God and sensitive to God, but I'm not going to live in an environment where I just backbite and gossip and talk about people. I'm just not going to do it. I'm just, because I love God. I want to, let me just, okay, just loosen up for a moment. Okay, I can just tell. Some of y'all are a little tense right now. Let me just, look, look. I am not talking about us. <laughs> I'm talking about people we know. How many of you know what I'm saying? So just loosen up, nudge, do me a favor. Just nudge the person next to you and say, relax. Just relax. He is not talking about us. He is talking about people we know. He's in, and if any of this, if, if you know, <laughs> We're going to get into God's word. And what we're going to do is we're going to see what God says about it. I remember that when I was, um, this was about 25 years ago. And a couple of buddies of mine in California were doing this, heading this mountain bike trip. And it was about 30 miles. And they said, do you want to go mountain biking? And I'd never been mountain biking, really. And they said, it's going to be easy. They lied to me. Is, um, they said, it's going to be easy. You got to come mountain biking. So I went mountain biking with them. And, and they could tell that I was not used to mountain biking like them. And so what happened is, is about every half hour during the ride, one of the guys that was really good would just slow down and he would come back to me and he would look at me and he'd say, how you doing? And I'd say, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. And but about every 30 minutes, he'd come back and he'd say, how you doing? So I'm just going to tell you something through this message. I'm going to slow down. And I'm just going to look at y'all and say, how you doing? <laughs> how many of you know what I'm saying? Are you doing, are you still on the bike? Are you still with me? You know what I'm saying? Are you still, you still pedaling? Have you piled up back there and you just left me? You know what I'm saying? Let me just say, we need steak and cherry pie and ice cream messages, but we also need broccoli and salad and asparagus as well. And today is an asparagus moment. So, so I want to just encourage you. I love asparagus. How many of you are with me? Come on. Okay, what don't we? Today is a liver moment. <laughs> okay, look. <laughs> you know, we live in a fallen world. We just live in this fallen world where they see nothing wrong with trashing people. 
They see nothing wrong with it. I'm going to tell you something. God sees something wrong with it. He sees something wrong and we're going to see in his word. And what, what we've got to realize is God is saying, this affects my sensitivity to the Lord. And what we're going to see is that his word teaches against it in our lives. He's saying, excuse me, do you want to live higher, Mike? Or do you want to live lower, Mike? See, in this context of too strong, what it is, is strong in the Bible, but sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in Galatians 5, verse 13. It says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't, don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. See, God is saying, come on, I want to help. And what it is, is we do, we can do whatever we want to do. But I'm going to tell you what, if we want to live too strong, then we got to begin to guard this in our life. Where we begin to stop and say, you know what, when this stuff is going on, I am just not going to get into it. Look at what it says in James 1.26. It says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. That's what he said. God, that's what God said. You know, the King James, if you look it up, it says that if you don't, if we don't bridle our tongue, our religion is in vain. Two words in there, bridle. How many of you know what a bridle goes on a horse and what it does? What a bridle is, I've never seen a horse run up and say, put the bridle on. How many of you know what I'm saying? Because what it represents is pain in turning. And what God is saying here is he's saying, if this has been a propensity in your life, he said, I want you to begin to bridle yourself. I want you to put something on on and discipline yourself because he said, if you don't, your religion is in vain. If you look up that word vain in the original language, what it says is it means powerless and useless. God said, if we don't bridle our tongue, our relationship with him is going to be powerless and useless. And we're going to be saying, God, where is the power? And God is saying, I want you to begin to rein in your tongue. How many of you know what I mean? And what it is, is some of us, this isn't a problem, but to others of us, this is our area. This is an area that it's like, and so just relax, just relax. But what it is, I like that King James says in about um, verse three, it says, he that backbiteth not with his tongue. If you look up the word backbite there, what it means is it means to walk along and to be a talebearer. That is to slander. It also means to lead about, to search for, and to spy out. See, we shouldn't be looking for dirt. We should not be looking for it. We shouldn't be looking for stuff. Have you ever been around somebody and they're just looking for something? They're spying it out. They're looking for it in order to repeat it and to say it. You know, the root word to this word backbite, it carries two connotations. The first one is this, is it's part of the way that we walk and we live. We look for things we don't agree with so we can talk about it to other people. God is saying, stop it. But then the next word that he used, if you look at the root word, is it's that we allow ourselves to, it to stagger into our lives. See, we need to guard our lives from doing this or allowing those that are around us to use our ears for their dumpsters. How many of you know what I'm saying? Where we just stop and we say, I am not gonna let my ears be used. You say, well, I don't do it. I wanna tell you something. Do you sit around? and listen to it. Do you sit around and just sit there and listen to it? Joyce said she wasn't doing it, but she was just listening to it and it affected her. Look at what it says in Proverbs 26, verse 17 through verse 22. 
It says, he who passing by stops to meddle with strife that is none of his business is like one who takes a dog by the ears. I remember when I was four years old, we had this little black dog and its name was Inky. And I was four and um, I grabbed Inky by the ears and Inky bit me right on the face, right there. You say, for you to remember that when you were four, it was a traumatic experience. I loved Inky and I thought he loved me until he bit me. <laughs> but let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you something. If we meddle in strife that is none of our business, God said, you're gonna get bit. It's gonna bite you right in the face. He said, he's saying, stop and don't allow yourself to go there. You can say amen. amen. Verse 18, like a madman who casts firebrands, arrows in death, so is a person who deceives his neighbor and then says, was I not joking? What I want you to notice is this is the person who talks about people and then gets caught and says, I was just joking. I really didn't mean it. God says, you're crazy if you think like that. He said, you're like a madman. He said, that's what God said. Look at verse 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there, there is no whisperer, contention ceases. Verse 21, as coals are to hot embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person to inflame strife. Verse 22, the words of a whisperer or a slanderer are like dainty morsels or words of sport. What is a dainty morsel? That's like, how many of y'all got a donut out there today? He said, the words of a whisperer are like a Twinkie. They're like a donut. He said, you, you think, oh, this is good. And we put it in our mouth and we start eating it. But then look at what he said. But to others, they are like deadly wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the body of the victim's nature. What God is saying is that when we allow ourselves to talk about people or to get an environment that he said, it wounds you spiritually and you don't even know it. You don't even see it. And you might think it's not a big deal, but God says it is. Look at what it says in Psalms 1, verse 1 through verse 3. It says blessed, and then it defines the word blessed and the amplified is happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. How many of us want to be happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable? Yeah. Eight of us, that's wonderful. I said, how many of us want to be happy, fortunate, prosperous and enviable. He's getting ready to tell us. Look at what he said. Is the person who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the paths where sinners walk. Now look at this, nor sits down to relax and to rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. God says, if you want to be happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable, don't sit down around people who are just mocking and strife and gossip and that kind of stuff because it will affect his favor upon our lives. Amen? Amen. It, it, it says, nor, if you look at verse three, it says, nor takes up reproach. We read this earlier against his neighbor. In other words, they just won't let it be around them. I think that this is everybody and anybody where we just simply stop, stop and we say, you know what? From this day forward, Lord, I need you to help me, but I am not gonna talk about people. I am not gonna join in talking about people because Lord, what I realize is this, is that is carnal, it is soulish, and it is wrong, and you have called me to a higher life. And so Lord, I'm asking you to help me. Help me, God, to not get drawn into this. It says in Psalms, or pardon me, Proverbs 6, 19, it says that God hates those who sow discord. That's what God said. He said, I hate those who sow discord. What we have got to realize is that we love people, but what it is, is we've got to stop and say, you know what? I'm going to cultivate an environment around me that is healthy, that will not allow this, that doesn't cultivate this because it affects my relationship with the Lord. Look at what it says in Psalms 34. Did you notice I'm giving you a whole bunch of verses? Say, why are you giving me? Because this goes so cross to our culture today. 
It goes so cross. I mean, you can't walk up the grocery store aisle and the craziness of this person came from an alien. You know, what I mean? you know what I'm saying? You're standing there just talking a bunch of smack and a bunch of junk and a bunch of stuff. And we just get so conditioned to it where we just accept it. Look at Proverbs 34 verse 12. What person are they who desires life and longs for many days that, he may, that they may see good? Look at what it says. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek, inquire for, and crave peace and pursue and go after it. You know, I think this is so much against our culture today. Let me just say, I believe in being, we as Christians need to be informed about what's going on in our nation. We should be informed, but I tell you what, so much of the media today is a bunch of garbage. Just talking about this, talking about that. They said this, you know what? Um, and if you'll, you'll pardon my English, I won't say French, you'll say my English, is just quit talking about everybody else. Shut up and tell me what you believe. That's what I wanna know. The whole politic thing of everybody is throwing mud and throwing this and throwing that. Let me tell you something, it shouldn't be the body of Christ. It should not be. We need to stop in our lives and say, God, am I cultivating this in my heart and in my life? You know, years ago, and I stand to your feet if you would, I gotta close. But years ago, as the band's coming up, I wanna tell you a story. I think it was 13 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, someone came up to me at the, on a Wednesday night service and I was up here and and I noticed it was a couple and they always sat way in the back and they only came on Wednesday, which told me that, you know, maybe they were working at different times or something. And I found out really what it was is they were just checking us out, and loved the church and wanted to start coming, but they had this really serious question to me. And they came up and, and he was behind her and she was leading the pack. How many of y'all know it's not good when the guy is pushing his wife to the front of the pile and he's saying, you ask him. You ask him. And so she comes up and I'm standing like right over here. And she comes up with this really perplexed look on her face. And she says, Pastor, we have a question for you. And I said, okay, what is it? And I could tell it was taking everything they could to muster it up. She looks at me and she says, do you own the five o'clock bar? <laughs> Someone told us that you own the five o'clock sports bar. <laughs> and we can't join your church if you're a bar owner. <laughs> I looked and I did everything to hold it back. But I looked and I said, if I own the five o'clock bar, then they owe me some money. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and then she smiled. I'm so glad you don't own the five o'clock sports bar because we love your church. But if you are a bar owner, we couldn't come. And I looked and I said, who told you that I owned the five o'clock? By the way, if you're the five o'clock sports bar owner and you're in here or you watch this, no condemnation, okay? It was just for me. <laughs> and I said, who told you? They said, somebody that doesn't even go to this church. They told us that you're that pastor of that church. Isn't his name Michael J? And they said, wasn't even my last name, but they said he owns the bar. I just sat there and thought to myself, craziness. I mean, how many times have people just gotten involved with stupid stuff? And God is saying, you're grieving my spirit. You're grieving my spirit. As how about rather than get involved, say, Lord, I'm gonna pray for that person. I'm gonna pray for them. Amen. God, today, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit within our lives. Lord, we are so grateful for the truth of your word. And Lord, what we realize, 
Lord, last week we talked about that, Lord, you want us to speak and think the truth of your word in our heart. But Lord, today what you're saying to us is that you want your grace to affect how we talk about other people. Lord, right now, we just repent. Lord, we repent and we're sorry. Lord, we didn't see it. God, we didn't know it. Lord, we saw so many scriptures today that apply to it. But Lord, if it's been our trip up, we ask you to help us. Help us, God, to grow in this area of our life. Lord, we say yes to you. Say that with me, say yes. Yes, yes Lord. Help me, Lord, to grow in this area. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. To the Lamb, the glorious man, Jesus, we say yes unto the Lamb, the glorious man, Jesus, we say to the Lamb, the glorious man, Jesus, we say yes, unto the Lamb, the glorious man, Jesus. us to avoid the potholes and the pitfalls and Lord the stuff that disrupts and messes with our relationship with you and God today we say thank you Lord we invite your Holy Spirit into our lives to help us help us to grow help us to see it help us to be courageous Lord help us to be bold thank you Lord with every head bowed and every eye closed you know, the most important decision you will ever make in your life is not your mate. It's not your career path. It's not where you're gonna live. It's not how many kids you're gonna have. But the most important decision you will ever make in your life is what will I do with the person of Jesus? Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus gave his life to purchase for you and I a relationship with God that is second to none. Jesus prayed this, Father, show them that you love them as much as you do me. Christianity is not about joining a church. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship where we come to a place where we realize that we've missed it, we've screwed up, we've made mistakes, and God is on the outside, but he was not happy to leave it there. He sent his son Jesus to pay for every mistake that we have ever made so that we 
could come into a personal relationship with a loving God who wants us to know him and sense him in every area of our life. He wants to free us from all of the junk of the past. He wants to open our eyes to his goodness, his love, his mercy, and his grace. He wants us to know that nothing in the past is greater and stronger than his love toward us. But it all starts where I recognize my need for him. And I come to a place in my life where I say, Lord, I need you. And I'm asking you, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. You're here today and you've never done that. Right now, the Lord is using me to reach into your life because he loves you. This isn't about me. This is about Jesus and where you're at with him. He gave his life because God loves you. But only you can say, yes, I choose you today. You're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ. You've never come to God and say, God, I need you. I wanna pray with you right where you're at. If that is you, I want you on the count of three to lift your hand to the Lord. Lifting your hand, what you're saying is you're saying, Lord, I pick you, I choose you, and I say yes to you. That is you today on the count of three. One, two, three, lift your hand to the Lord. Lift it up. Say, Lord, that is me. Thank you. Thank you. God is reaching into your life. Thank you. Reaching into your heart. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Let's all pray this. Say this with me. Jesus, I believe that you gave your life to pay for my mistakes. And I'm asking you, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart. I give you my past. I give you my future. And from this day forward, you are not just Savior, but you are Lord of my life. Help me to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at me today. You prayed that and you meant it. You either lifted your hand or maybe you didn't. And you said, that was me and I know it. I gave the Lord my heart today. I want you in just a moment, as we close this portion of the service, I want you to come up. There'll be a few of us up here. We wanna help you in that decision. Or maybe you're here today and you say, I know the Lord, but I need prayer. I've got things going on in my life. I wanna encourage you, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Have a great week. And don't forget, pick up all your neighborhood kids, pack them in your car and drop them off on Monday morning. God bless you.